Daniel. We're in chapter 2 today. <clears throat> no, we're not. We're in chapter 2 next week. We're in chapter 1 today. We're going to walk through chapter 1, verses 3 through 21. There is a study guide for chapter 2 that's available out on the podium or on the welcome desk out there. And um, you'll also get that in an email as well in case you forget to pick one up or accidentally leave one here. Um, you can print that off tomorrow when the video of this Bible study goes out. Daniel is an exciting book. Um, I, I was talking with Alex a few minutes ago. He said, y'all are going through Daniel, right? And um, he said, you're going through the narrative right now, but the visions are coming later. And I said, I know. <laughs> I love the narrative. I'm a little bit nervous about the vision. So you pray for me, and I'll pray for you, and we'll walk through this together and see what God has for us in this. But um, next week, we'll actually look at one of the visions that Daniel um, encountered from the King Nebuchadnezzar. But today, before we get there, we are just at the very beginning of, of Daniel. We just went through the first five verses last week, and today we're backing up a little bit to verse 3, just to help us with the, the context of this particular passage. Um, let me ask a little quiz here, a little quiz questions. Where was Daniel in this story? Where was the book of Daniel taking place? In Babylon, that's right. He was in exile in Babylon. He and his friends um, were taken, three of his friends were taken from Judah um, and taken captive in, into Babylon. Why did he write this book? Daniel wrote this book to encourage the Jews who were in exile, but also Daniel wrote this book as a prophecy. God gave him the prophecy to encourage all believers from that point on, to encourage us, you and me, because he speaks of things that are, uh, were going to happen in the future in Daniel's time, but also are going to happen in, in the future from our perspective. And so some of the things that we read about are, have unfolded and are unfolding and will unfold in, in, as time progresses. And y'all, every day we're a day closer to this millennial kingdom that we, um, that we see God's word talk about. We're a day closer to eternity with the Lord forever in heaven. Um, God's greatest purpose in this, in this book is that it points to the gospel of Jesus. That's all of scripture. And so that's, Daniel is not like, well, we have the gospel in all scripture, except there's Daniel over here on the side. No, Daniel is a part of the whole context of Scripture, and it points us to Jesus Christ. And we'll see that um, today as well, even. Yes? Wow. How about that? Even, even in exile. It's not like, well, God's only going to be mentioned when you're in, his, in the Holy Land. No, he's mentioned because he's everywhere. And he's mentioned 119 times in, in Daniel. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, when, when, Daniel, I mean, when Daniel was in Judah, we know that um, Babylon came and invaded Judah um, three times that we know of. And Daniel was taken in 605 B.C., I believe it is, and was taken to Babylon in, one, in the early wave. Um, one, ver one commentator said 602, but somewhere in that time frame of 605 to 602, Daniel was taken out. I believe it was 605. Um, in a later wave, by sidebar here, in a later wave in 597, when Babylon came back in and took some more of the Jewish people out, Ezekiel was taken out. And so Daniel as a prophet, and Ezekiel was, ended up being a prophet while in exile in Babylon as well. And I know some of you are studying Ezekiel right now, so um, you're studying in the same time frame, both of them being in exile um, in Babylon Daniel and his friends, they were chosen to go into the king's service, weren't they? They were part of the nobility or they were part of the royalty. And so the king selected some of those exiles and said, I want you to come into training. And it's not like, would you like to come? He didn't offer this to them as an option. He said, you will come into training. And there for three years, this training program was, they would be well versed into the Babylonian culture. Um, that was the whole point of this. They would be assimilated into the Babylonian culture to be in service to the king and actually, very early on, which we'll see today in just a moment, that brought them very quickly to a crisis of belief, to a situation where now they have to make a choice. Am I going to stay true to God, or am I going to compromise in order to maintain peace and my own personal physical well-being? And so we'll see that. So right now, let's just jump right on here in Daniel 1, verses 3 through 6 is where we'll start. And they are in Babylon. The king 
ordered Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the nobility, um, young men without any physical defect, good-looking, suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledgeable, perceptive, and capable of serving in the king's palace. I'm thinking they must have been like Mike Winfrey or somebody, and they got chosen to come and to be, <laughs> to be serving in the, king here, in the king's service here. So um, he was to teach them the Chaldean language and the literature. Verse 5, the king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he drank every day. They got the good stuff that the king would get. They were to be trained for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to attend the king. Among them, from the Judahites, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So when you read this passage right here, if you didn't know that they were being taken into exile by an ungodly culture, you may think, wow, they went on a three-year, all-inclusive vacation. Here they are, they're going to be feeding, feed, feeding with the best foods. They're going to be educated with the best education. It's going to be the opposite of military boot camp. This is going to be the best thing in the world. Except there was, a, there was a, an ungodly purpose in every bit of this. The point was that they would be groomed by the ungodly king in order to be assimilated into the Babylonian culture. And the things that they knew were to diminish as the things that they would learn were to increase. And that was the point of every bit of this. You know, sometimes you can accomplish things. You've heard it said, you, you know, sometimes you can accomplish things better with honey than you can with vinegar. And that was what was going on there. There was a lot of honey that was being served to them, figuratively speaking, maybe literally speaking. There was a lot of rich things that were being brought before them in order that their brain would be engaged with the Babylonian ways and the Babylonian worldview. The food, that, there's a marked difference between what the royal food was and even others in the service to the king would normally eat, not to mention the royal food and the common people. So there was a huge difference um, in, in, the, in the kind of food that they would be provided. Think about the best thing that you've, one of the best things that you've ever eaten. Have you eaten something that's not normally part of your diet, but it is, it is the good stuff, the rich stuff? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, every now and then, I don't, I, must, I don't assume you have lobster every day. That stuff's not cheap. But I know one time we went down to Haiti, actually more than once, we went down to Haiti, and down there, we, we went to a, a, a little coast grill, and lobster is more available down there than it is right here. And the next thing I know, the, the director of the children's home we were at, he, he had them bring out platters for us to eat from, and it was filled with lobster. And I thought, I've never paid for lobster in my life because I see the price of that, and I see the price of a fish sandwich, and I'm thinking, <laughs> I'll just take the fish sandwich. But it was so good. Have you ever heard of Wagyu beef? Wagyu beef is the most expensive beef there is that I'm aware of out of Japan. And it's because of the, the pr premium beef that has such high fat content marbled all through it that it's supposed to be the best steak or the best beef that you can get. Up to $200 a pound. We're going this afternoon if anybody wants to go. We need somebody to pay the bill, though. You will? All right, awesome. Well, I'll drive the van. I think we're going to fill it up. <laughs> um, this was much like what they were being provided. It was the best of the best. And that was the king's, that was the king's food. They were also given the, the best education. They were given the literature from the Babylonians to read and to become well-versed in, that they can understand not just um, stories, but the the worldview of the Babylonian culture, in order that they may be indoctrinated without it seeming like an unpleasant indoctrination. It'd be a pleasant indoctrination, comfortable indoctrination. Um, basically, the Nebuchadnezzar is saying, I want you to learn to look to me for everything. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> The enemy still uses that same tactic today. God can do this, but there's a shortcut here. 
And if you'll just go this way, you will live the good life. And the enemy does the same thing today. But he also continued, not just in providing these, these things, um, the, the comforts and the richness and the exquisiteness of the royal food and the royal education. Look in verse 7. He does something here to also help them to become assimilated um, into the Babylonian culture. Verse 7 says, the chief unit gave them names. They got new names. It says, he gave them the, na the name Belteshazzar to Daniel, Shadrach to Hananiah, Meshach to Mishael, and Abednego to Azariah. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but when we talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we're actually referring to them by their Babylonian names, aren't we? Interesting that we do that, but we don't call Daniel Belteshazzar. We talk to him by his Hebrew name. We call him by his Hebrew name. Scripture, uh, we'll see, refers to them. Once you get to a certain passage, it flips over and it starts referring to, to the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because it's in the Babylonian culture that they're in. It's written in the language that they would be referred to. But a little bit later, we'll see them still referred to as Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. But there's meaning to these names. There's a reason they changed their names. Um, Daniel means God is my judge. That's what his name literally means, but it was changed to Belteshazzar, which means, O oh lady, protect the king. And the lady speaking to the wife of the god of Baal, B-E-L. Um, and so his name had to do now with, with the religious aspect of the Babylonian culture, not the Hebrew God, the Lord, God is my judge. Daniel's new name, actually, sidebar here, Daniel's new name is the same name as Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belteshazzar, which we'll see later in, in chapter 9, I believe it is, in, in Daniel. Um, but now his Hebrew name means, means something different. The name Mishael originally meant, or does mean, who is, who is as God? There's no one. That's a, that's a rhetorical question. Who is like God? There's no one like him. That's what Meshach means. But it's, I mean, Mishael means. He got changed to Meshach, which, sent, which now means who is like God? Shaq, or A-K-U, Aku, which is another Babylonian um, deity, a goddess or a female deity that was worshipped. The name Azariah means the Lord is my help. That's a great Hebrew name. Lord is my help. And it was changed to Abednego, and it means servant of Nebo. The king was attempting to destroy their religious and cultural identity, and in a sense, to make them of the Babylonian world, not just in the Babylonian world. Now, I hope that rings a little bell with you. Of the Babylonian world, but not, not, in the, not just in the Babylonian world. Because when Jesus prayed for his followers, this, are you, is this ringing a bell when Jesus prayed for his followers in John 17? He recognized his followers that they were in the world, but they were not of the world. Not just not to be of the world, but they were not of the world. God's purpose for his children from the before they were born is that they were going to be his. And so we are to reflect the truth of how God sees us and that we're in the world as his children, but we're not of the world. We were sent into the world to proclaim the message of Christ. And in a sense, that's what's happening here with Daniel and his friends. They are in Babylon. But he's going to continue pointing to Jehovah God all through it. And we see Satan doing the same thing today, y'all. He tries to assimilate us into being of the world. How does he do this? I don't have to tell you. You weren't born yesterday, were you? You know already many of the ways that Satan seeks to influence you to be not just in the world, to be of the world. And to be children of darkness rather than children of light. To have a worldview that doesn't reflect God's word, but have a worldview that reflects human, humanitarian or human, humanism is what I'm trying to think of saying, or reflect something that's anti-God. And he does this many ways. Media is a big way. We're constantly bombarded, aren't we, with, with messages that says um, this worldview is better. You don't need God. You can be your own God. Almost every worldview outside of the biblical worldview points to you being on the throne of your life. But this book, God's word points to Christ being the throne of your life. And we also have this flesh 
we have this flesh that in Romans 7, Paul tells us that our flesh has no good in it. It seeks to sin, constantly seeks to sin, constantly seeks to sin, constantly seeks to sin because it's a sin nature. And that's our flesh. And so when God has the truth before us, the flesh says, no, I want a different way. And that's why we cling so much to false messages sometimes if, we're, if we walk in the flesh and not in the spirit. If we're blinded by Satan and we don't allow God's spirit to enlighten us with the truth of God. And so this, this tactic of Satan is still um, similar to what was going on here by the king, of Neb the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, in the life of Daniel and Shadrach, or Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Let me say that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So some of the ways of the enemy are very overt and some are covert. And many of these take place even in the, we have to know that the people around us that don't know Christ, they're not the enemy, by the way. <laughs> they're prisoners of war. And we have to be intentional to love and to listen and to point to Christ. But people, prisoners of war that are um, held captive to the worldview can also be influences in our own lives if we don't stand firm on the truth of God. I know some well-meaning lost people who have a philosophy that is comfortable, it's, it sounds good, it's warm, it seems like there's a goodness about it, but the goodness ultimately points to man being good and not the heart of man is turned from God, which it is. And I, I must know that the only truth, the only goodness, ultimately is going to be found in, in God himself, in Christ. And so I have to make sure that we have to make sure that our identity is not influenced to be changed like the Babylonians were seeking to change the identity of, of these guys. And it can be. Your flesh tries to tell you, even as a believer, when you do something good, you ever find yourself having to say, wow, God, well, not having to say, do you ever find yourself thinking, God must love me a little bit more today? And maybe it's not that conscious of a thought. But maybe if you avoid a temptation, you really wanted to give in a temptation, but you didn't. Is there something in there, is there something in your nature sometimes that says, man, I, I fought that on my own and I overcame it. And, and that's a seed of pride getting ready to, to be planted. And we constantly find ourselves in this battle of our identity being changed as a child of the one true God, the one who our identity is now. I know, I know who we are. You know who you are because of who Jesus says you are and what God's word says you are. Not because of um, what your flesh would tell you that you're good on your own and your heart is good and you don't need God. And you, you can make it on your own. A little bit of God's okay, but not a whole lot. Well, that's not the identity that God has for you. In his word, his, his word says that you are created in the image of God. That's who God sees you. You are his creation. But in Christ, we're adopted into his family. And now we're born again. We're, in, we're his children. And that's the way God sees you. Do you understand you're a child of God? The world tries to tell you, Psh, you're not really. Now, maybe you were at one point in your life, but because of these circumstances, you're a little bit less of a child of God than you were. You know, in our, in, our, in our culture, it seems like that for many people, age diminishes the value of someone. And we kind of fall into that in the way we say things. Sometimes, I'm, I, my dad used to say, "Son, I'm just, I'm just getting where I'm just not any good anymore. I can't do what I used to do." And I'll tell you, his value was never in what he could do; it's in who he was. But we can fall into the same thing, can't we? Ah, you know, I'm just, it's not worth much anymore. And the culture kind of feeds into that, even the term "old." <laughs> I'm not a fan of the term old because I know what it means a lot of times in our culture. When you open up your refrigerator and you pull something out and you say, oh, that's old. It's usually not a, not a good thing, right? It's past its expiration date maybe. <laughs> or it's got a little extra stuff growing on it that didn't used to be there. Oh, that's old. There are some cultures that value elderly, which have a respect, high respect and honor for elderly. 
God's Word does. That's one area that God's Word goes counter to our culture. We are to honor our elders, honor those that get older. There's a respect um, that is, is meant to be in place by, from younger people to older people. And um, that's just one way, but no matter how old you get or how young you are, when you know Jesus, your value is because of who you are in him. And age does not make you more valuable, but it doesn't make you less valuable. And I praise the Lord for that, because that's where our real identity is, is what it says in his word. We're free, we're justified, we're redeemed, we're joint heirs with Christ. Let me, I'm just going to share this with you, what his word says. These are just a few of the things he says about you and me in Christ. We're forgiven we're a friend of God, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit, we're righteous, we're a child of God, and we're a citizen of heaven. This earth is not our home. We live here now, but it's not our home. Daniel and his friends, they lived in Babylon, but that's not where their citizenship was. And even though there was a tremendous influence to make them of Babylon, they chose differently. And I'm going to run out of time on that point right there if we're not careful. So let me just move on here. This is, this is such good. Yeah. Yes. The king. Are y'all hearing this? Yeah, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. So that's more than just a friendly influence. <laughs> How about that? That's great. Yeah. That is awesome. Right. Daniel and his friends would be relatives of Zedekiah, who was going to be king later than, than when they got taken into exile. Yeah, wow, didn't know that. Would, would you say they're set up? That he did what? Oh, yeah, I would. That's definitely in. Uh, yeah. So he removed the potential for passions anywhere else. <laughs> Central focus. Huh? That's right. Very interesting. Very insightful. That's good. Thank you. Y'all, thank you for sharing insights like that or any others that you find. I love learning um, what God's Word has to say and, and the truth in all of this. Verse 8 through 16 is our next section. Let's see, um, let's see what they did that was intentional to live their lives being faithful to Jehovah even while being in Babylon. Daniel determined um, that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. We're going to come back to the word defile, and I asked you a question on the study guide, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to defile himself. God had granted Daniel kindness and compassion from the chief eunuch. Yet he said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and drink. What if he sees your faces looking thinner than the other young men your age? You would endanger my life, the eunuch's life, uh, with the king. In your study guide, you had the question, what was it about the king's food or wine that Daniel considered unclean or defiling? What was it about that? Did anybody dig into that a little bit and see what could it have been about the food that Daniel said, I'm, I'm not defiling myself with the king's food? Could have been offered to idols. That's one thing I read, yeah. So he didn't want to use food that had been offered to idols. Could very well have been. Bad food? <laughs> oh, bad cook. 
You go, you tell somebody to cook food for you. I am not defiling myself with that meal right there. <laughs> um, so there is an aspect to, I think, what I, one of the things I found out, there is an aspect that it could have been offered to idols, although um, grains were also offered to idols. And so here they're saying, can we eat vegetables and grains? So that may have been a part of the answer, but it doesn't satisfy completely why they would have thought that. But it does part of it. And wine would not have been... Um, a, a defiling thing for the Jewish person according to the law that they had. So they, yeah, they may have said, no. right. Yeah, yeah. There were some laws that had to do with what Jewish people could eat and couldn't, and there was probably a lot of pork involved in a Babylonian diet. Um, but, the, but then again, there w should have been some things there that could have been included in their diet, but they didn't want any of the king's food. They just wanted this, just vegetables, basically, is this vegetarian diet, which vegetarian is, was not something that was, a vegetarian diet was not something that was in any culture in that age that, that we can see that was prominent in any culture. Um, but maybe there was something about the nutrition of it. You might be right. May have been the the two hundred proof or whatever. <laughs> That's right. Could have been. And they thought, well, I can't even drink that because it's you know. Yeah. That's right. And even in the making of wine, there was laws about how things should have been handled in the making of the wine or the making of the food. And maybe that was a thought as well. You know, these aren't made according to the Jewish law. So I don't want to defile myself by partaking in the, the food, whether it's because of a spiritual reason nutritionally or a physical reason um, nutritionally. This may have been ceremonially unclean food, either in the, the end of it or the process of preparing it, or the beginning of it if it was a pig. Um, yes. Right. Yes. It it very well could have been. That's right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't always stand. You know, what I've heard is when you go to foreign countries, don't don't drink the water, use the ice there because you will get sick. And I can't say, well, a woman in Haiti, I do what the Haitians do, and I'm going to, you know, because I will pay the price because my stomach's not used to that. But. It wasn't, well, learning the language was a part of the, you know, part of the process of training them, but they were being trained to come into the king's service, to be completely devoted in serving the king. Because the Jews, they weren't the only Jews that were taken. But if there were Jewish people who were of great influence, because that's why the listing is there, because these things, what does it matter if someone's good looking or not? But there is an influence that's brought about sometimes by people who are physically attractive when they speak. It's, I'm not saying it's right, I'm just saying it's real. Sometimes someone that is intelligent, physically attractive, able to speak well, then they have an influence on others around them. So if the king can capture them, it can have an influence on all the other exiles that, you know, that they may not mount a rebellion or make something ugly. I think that's one of the reasons. Um, 
And, and if they can be fully engaged in the Babylonian culture, then it enables others to say, well, I can compromise. They compromise, and they're doing okay. Look at them. I can, I can compromise. And that would be defiling in itself. Maybe that's exactly what it was, is, is that the culture itself was where they were trying to refrain from engaging in the Babylonian culture. They chose differently. Could be. Right. Which would also announce a divide among the hearts. Yeah. I think um, all of these may actually be speak into the why behind it, and I don't know if we're going to land on anything saying this is absolutely it, but you guys are sharing some great insights into this about what it could be. The point is, I'm sorry? Yeah. Yeah, you'll get everything from me. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like this this wasn't a decision for him. A decision had been made prior to this. And and his yes prior to this took care of the no's that come out of that. You know, I, th my purpose is to honor God. And I don't know if you heard Doug, but he's saying he purposed in his heart, and I think that's the New King James Version as well that says that. My version, um, CSB version here says he determined. But purpose in his heart to me is also a better visual of what's going on there because, y'all, when we make a commitment to the Lord, um, well, there's two ways to go about this. I can try to make a decision every time a conflict comes up. I'll be making decisions all day, every day. Or I can purpose in my heart, and you can too, to honor God. And when we do that, when we say, Lord, you are my everything, and I want to honor you with everything, then that automatically makes the decision for so many things that you and I encounter. Um, no, I'm not saying, well, other Christians do it, so it makes it okay. I'm saying, no, I've already made this commitment, and this is a commitment that I'm going to carry out in my life. I'm not judging others. I'm saying, for me, I've made a decision not to defile myself. And sometimes that means setting boundaries. And we're, you and I are probably going to set boundaries at different places. And you and the person next to you may set boundaries at different places. Ultimately, there's a defilement that takes place. And, and because of the actions that we, play, that we do, actually it's born out of our hearts. But there's some things I don't do now. I'll go ahead and tell you. There's some things I don't do now that you know, my children may do or my neighbor may do. And it's not because I'm self-righteous or you're self-righteous if you do that. It's because I don't want to start down that road. <laughs> because right now I can say, I want to honor the Lord in this. And right now I know I can draw the line right here and I'm honoring the Lord in this. And would it be, would it be wrong for someone who would cross this line and they're doing this? I'd say if their heart is to honor the Lord and they drew the line somewhere else, that's the Lord's job now to convict them. His word, his spirit to convict them. And I don't want to hold my, my standard to someone else if I know I drew the line here in order for me not to go further. And I'm, I'm almost wanting to name the issue, but I'm not. But there's different places that we can land on different issues. Some, th some places that Scripture does not say, do not do this. But there's some things I, do, I won't do because even though the Scripture doesn't say don't do it, I don't want to get to a place where that's now my master. And now I'm serving... <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar. There he is. Yeah. 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 
Oh, yeah. That's right. No, it's not. We can't ever lose our sensitivity to the Lord and what He's doing and where He is in our life. That's exactly right. So, y'all, we're out of time, actually a little bit over. So here's what we're going to do. Thank you for your insights and for everyone sharing today. This is a blessing. And one of the reasons I didn't map out the whole study for Daniel is for this reason, because sometimes the Lord's going to, he's really going to fill our, our, our spirits and our souls with his word as we share this word together. And so it's not a lecture to get through. It's Bible study together. And I'm thankful for your willingness to be a part of that at home and here. So next week, we're going to pick back up, and we will finish this particular study. I don't know that we'll get to chapter 2 next week. We might. But this time, we'll, be, we'll, we'll finish this study um, in chapter 1. So if you didn't get a chance to finish, now you have a chance. And there's a couple more questions on the study guide that um, one of them has to do with that right there, um, about purpose in our heart and making that commitment before we go into situations. So if it's okay, we're going to park here, and then we'll pick back up next week. And so I'm going to close us in prayer, and then we'll, we'll slip out. Father, I thank you so much for your faithfulness. God, you are so good, and you're challenging us and reaching our hearts. Lord, I pray that today, that for how your Spirit has spoken to each one of us, as we pray for each other, as we pray for needs, or in our Bible study, as we study together and heard conversations, Lord, may the takeaway be exactly what you want for each one of us. And mine may be a little bit different than someone else's at this point because of where I am in my life and someone else may be in a, a different place. But maybe the takeaway that you've given us in your word be that we are encouraged to follow you faithfully, to surrender everything to you, that we would put our yes, Jesus, on the table no matter what else comes to the table. We already know and are committed to surrendering ourselves completely to you and to following you faithfully. And Lord, when we stray, when we are tempted to stray even, may your spirit quicken our hearts towards following you, towards turning, towards confessing and repenting and saying, Lord, I see myself going in this direction. Thank you for making me aware and help me to follow you faithfully. So Lord, may we, may we love you and follow you today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you all. Thank you all so much for being here. Remember, next week we're going to pick right back up at verse 8. Verse 8. God bless you. Be safe in this snow.